Yo, Elliot, last week you answered my question about dealing with people's stupidity, and you talked a lot about how Satan influences people. I see this in my own life and can't help but think he wins a lot. I find myself frustrated and angry about all sorts of things during the day. I am two years sober off of everything, and I feel like Satan is trying really hard to keep me all fucked up any way he can. Like, for example, clinging to a vape after quitting. Clinging to a vape again after quitting. I feel like I lose these simple emotional tests, and I'm all pissy about silly shit. How can I better battle Satan in my life and win on a daily basis. So the very first thing I will offer you is this, that whenever you judge yourself and start beating yourself up, you're doing Satan's job for him. You got to understand that God doesn't want you to beat yourself up. God doesn't require that of you. He requires your submission to his law and to his son, Jesus Christ right? Living within the Ark of the Covenant. That's what he expects of us. But with that, those things are given because he knows we're fallen. He knows that we are weak. He knows that we are under all kinds of influence, influence from the world, demonic influence, influence of just our fallen nature. I never discount our own fallen nature, right? Because pointing the finger is, and objectifying Satan is very good. It's very helpful because it lets you, it reminds you that you're in a battle. But a lot of times we're in a battle with our own with our own fallen nature. And God knows this. If you read Psalm 51, King David, who was the wisest, he was the greatest warrior. He was like the first warrior king for Israel, right? Is that who they we call him back then? But the people of God. And even him, as much as God blessed him, he screwed up. He screwed up. You know what David did? David went and he sent all his warriors into battle. And while his warriors were away, he slept with his top commander's wife, <laughs> right? He slept with his top commander's wife and got her pregnant. And that was a messed up thing. And he knew he messed up. And not only that, he, he gets even worse. He does even worse things. And so he started to suffer the consequences of this stupid action. He, you know, for men in the Bible, it's the funniest thing because the Bible will tell us about our own lives. And if you notice that all the most powerful men fall as a result of lust for women, women destroy the most powerful men in the Bible. Just look, look at Solomon, right? Solomon had it all. He was, he was David's grandson. Solomon had it all, man. He was, he was king of the world at the time, but he loved that peace leave a little bit too much. <laughs> and they led him astray. So it's always the women that kind of throw them off. But anyway, my point is that Psalm 51, which I don't remember, I should probably memorize it at some point. Uh, he asked God for forgiveness through his repentance. And it sounds something like this. I know that I failed. I know I screwed up. Forgive me, please, because I'm born into this fallen world and I'm surrounded by temptations. My enemies are always trying to take me out. But please, if you forgive me through my repentance and wash me white as snow, I promise that I will continue to do the right thing and bring people under your banner, something of that nature. I'm not getting, I'm not quoting the Bible properly, but this is essentially what Psalm 51 is about. And so God knows even his best people, his best soldiers, his best kings, his best men, they fall short. And so God knows you're going to fall short. What he doesn't want to have happen is that when you fall short, you stay down because you, uh, you stay pinned down under the, under the weight of your own judgment, right? He knows you're falling. You know you're falling. He knows you screwed up. You know you screwed up. But if you carry this, this attitude of repentance, carry, carry an attitude of humility and repentance, he is glad to help you overcome and to triumph if you ask him. Think about a parent. I'm a parent, right? Think about a parent. Think about a father to his children, right? My children screw up. My child screws up. She does something stupid. Like, yo, I told you not to do that, but then you went and did it anyway. What do you think my ultimate attitude is going to be towards that child if I love her or him? It's going to be, look, if you come to me and you apologize and you're truly repent, re, have repentance in your heart for what you did, just like the prodigal son, right? He know he screwed up. That's another great story. Let's go into that in a moment. But I'm just showing you the practicality of it in, in today, like today, as it relates to you and I. 
a good father and God is a good father is going to say, I know you screwed up. You're coming to me and you're saying your story. You're going to try again next time. I will give you that grace. I'll give you the opportunity. But if that child comes to me and is like unrepentant and not sorry and acting with a lot of pride and, and, uh, and, and pride in a way, when we judge ourselves, it's like we're trying to take God's place. And so it's a form of pride. Did you know that depression is like a form of pride? People who are depressed are narcissistic because they think so much of themselves that they're so damn important that they're judging everything that they do. It's a God complex. Depression, anxiety, worry, those are all God complexes. Those are all you trying to play God. And right now you're trying to play God by judging yourself. And he doesn't require that of you. He just requires you to be sorry and to try again. Never stop trying. But if you get to the point, there's another quote in the Bible where it says that you, those who persevere to the end will be saved. You got to keep trying. If you fall seven times, get up, eat eight, right? You said you've been trying to quit this vaping. Look, don't beat yourself up. Don't have, a, don't have too much judgment about it. But when that spark comes to you, I've done this before. I've done this before because I struggle the same way you guys. When you're driving in your car and you realize like, I'm disgusted with myself for smoking this thing, throw it out the window. You know how many times I've thrown stuff out the window while I'm driving just to be completely transparent with you guys? That sometimes I struggle. There are things I struggle with and I have to get it as far away from me as possible, right? Throw it out the window, burn it, right? Throw it in the garbage while the garbage man is right there. Like put it in the, I did this when I first quit smoking weed. I had this, I had a, I had a whole lot. And it, I saw the garbage man coming and I dumped that shit in the garbage can and watched him dump it. I was like, bye-bye, right? If I have to do that 10 times, I'll do that 10 times. If you got to do that 100 times, do it 100 times, but never, never, never give up. Try again, try again, try again tomorrow. And if you get to the point where you realize that you're too weak to do it, ask the father for help. That's what I had to do. I was too weak too. Ask the father for help. Please, Lord, help me. You say that you love me and that you want to see us do right and live righteous. I'm not going to try to take this away from myself because I failed too many times. You take it away from me and he'll take it away from you. It might be an easy takeaway or it might be a hard takeaway, <laughs> right? The hard takeaway is like, okay, now you have lung cancer. Are you going to, are you going to give it up yet? Some people, they're so stubborn that the answer is no. You, you might, you know, it might be something very simple, right? It might be like, wow, I'm getting this cough. And I'm starting to cough up blood. Okay. That's a sign. Let me stop. Right. And it could be worse, right? But the whole idea is that you, you can trust God to take these things away from you if you come with, a, with an attitude of repentance and you really and truly try and try and try again. The story of the prodigal son, I don't, I don't remember what's, what gospel that's in. It may, it may, it may be in Matthew. But Jesus tells the story of a prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son goes like this. There's, there's a son who lives in his father's castle. He has everything provided for him, but he wants to go out on his own. And he asks his father, he say, dad, can you give me half my inheritance? Give me my inheritance. I want to get out of here. And so the father, like, you know, like fathers to our own children or God, the father says, okay, you want that? All right. Okay. What are you going to do with it? He went and he squandered it. He was drinking and smoking and buying prostitutes and living a, living a whole degenerate, degenerate lifestyle. He's living a whole messed up lifestyle. And then once he realizes how far he's been led astray and that he's, he got to the point where he's like sleeping with the, with the, in the pig pen, he was feeding pigs, right? He wanted to eat the food the pigs were eating. And he was like, wow, my father has all this great food at his house. And I took, I took my money left and now I'm eating pig slop. He, can't, he turned around. This is key because this is what repentance is. He turned around. He's like, all right, I can't do this anymore. This is messed up. He turned around and started back towards his father's house. But this is where the story really, really starts to show you the grace of God. As he's walking back towards his house, to his father's house, his father notices, his father senses, oh, my son is coming home. I sent my son has repented and he's starting his way back, his journey back home. So the father comes and meets him halfway. The father leaves his castle and meets his son halfway as he's coming. So God will meet you halfway. God will meet you halfway. You throw that weed out the window and you say, damn, I repent. I'm going to try my best. And you start your way back home. 
God's going to meet you halfway. That's what the story is about. And the father meets the son halfway. And he says, welcome home, son. He puts a robe on him, puts fine shoes on him and throws a big party. Right. That's, that's, that's how God is relating to you, to us when we are living in that soup of sin. All right. So that's just some ideas on that, that hopefully will be of resource to you. The, the most practical point that I want you to take away, bro, is don't beat yourself up. Stop beating yourself up. Stop beating yourself up. There's no value in that. Repent, truly be sorry, but then leave it alone and allow God to meet you halfway. Hope that helps, done. Yo, it's your bro, Elliot. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, you ought to know that it was a clip from one of my most recent King Transformation classes with my students, where among other things, we get together about four or five hours a week and we speak on things as it relates to becoming kings in our lives and fitness, business, and with women. If that sounds like you and you wanna join a like-minded group of men who are growing stronger every day in every way in this degenerate age, then it's real simple. Just follow me on Instagram and then DM me the word king, K-I-N-G, and then me and my team will get back to the details to see if you qualify. I really hope to see you at the next meeting. Done.